Okay, welcome. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about uh, doing a literature review and we'll also talk a little bit about uh, peer review and what it means. Um, and yeah, this is in preparation uh, for where we're going in the class, where your, uh, your next assignment, which is due, uh, what is it, October 21st, I think, so about a week from uh, today if you're watching this on Wednesday or you know, whatever. Um, and that's going to be a sort of mini literature review that hopefully will give you lots of uh, uh, material to incorporate into your final paper for the class. And so ideally where we are at this point in the class, um, and of course you might be a little bit ahead or a little bit behind, it's not the end of the world, but this is like roughly my expectations about what's going on in the class right now. Um, you've settled on a topic or an area, um, and maybe you have a you know moderately specific topic or area. Um, you may have some concrete research questions already, in which case you're well on your way to through having your final paper uh, outline or framework in place, or you may still be thinking about what kinds of specific questions you wanna ask inside that area. You've hopefully done a bunch of reading, and actually, I mean, I know you've done a bunch of reading because I've been grading your homeworks, um, or not grading them, but responding to them. So then the assignment due next week is gonna involve uh, summarizing and organizing what you've read so far, as well as maybe a few other things. Um, and then at that point, once you get that information organized and stated clearly, and you're thinking about it uh, in a clear way conceptually, you're gonna be almost done with the introduction of your paper. Um, but there are, are a few steps to get from what you have now to a final literature review, and that's what uh, this week and this assignment are, are about in some sense. Um, so uh, what do we do when we do a literature review? Well, the first step is basically deciding what to include. Um, and this can be quite difficult depending on what you're studying. So there may be no literature on the exact question that you're interested in. Uh, but uh, the idea here, and one of the things I'll talk about in this lecture or focus on here, um, is that there's always going to be related literature, right? There's going to be something that somebody out there wrote that's going to help you figure out uh, how to get a foothold on the topic that you're studying and the questions that you're asking. Um, and, you know, in, in linguistics, uh, this can often be a similar question or the same question, but in a different language or with a different age group or in a different grammatical domain. Like if I'm asking a question about phonology and there's no literature, maybe somebody's asked the same kind of question but about syntax or something like that. Um, or it could be the same general kind of question but maybe in a different area. That's more maybe for um, experimental work like, well, I'm interested in studying this property with an experiment and I can't find any studies out there that ask uh, about this specific thing I'm studying with this specific kind of experiment but maybe there are similar experiments that have been done in other areas of research that I can take a look at. Um, and so one of the things we want to do here is cast a wide net um, when we're doing our literature review, but of course you can't cast it too wide or you'll never actually finish and you'll never even be able to find relevant stuff. Um, and so Perry in his chapter sort of represents this as a, as a, uh, a pyramid model where you can go broader or you can go narrower and you're going to need to strike a balance, right? Um, and so he uh, is specifically using the example of um, ESL writing and uh, learning strategies, right? So how uh, different individual learning strategies relate to outcomes in ESL writing or something like that. Um, and the point here is that if you look for all three of these keywords, and this is from ERIC, which is one of the uh, library databases that we looked at earlier this semester. Um, it's an applied linguistics database. Um, and so if you use all of these search terms, and this is like the full topic, uh, you get 11 articles, which, you know, is a fair number. And if they're all relevant and all sort of asking things that are related to your research question, then, you know, you're good at that point. Um, maybe you want to look a little bit broader, but you can at least browse those 11 articles. Maybe you're going to find that some of them are not actually relevant to what you're doing or that they're uh, not reliable or you don't like them or they're not asking the same kinds of questions that you're interested in. And so to broaden out, one of the things you can do is just drop specific terms of your research question or your research area and look at some more general areas, right? And so this is just a demonstration that if you... Uh, you know, drop out the learning strategies part of this, you're gonna get general background on uh, ESL and writing. Uh, well, he actually puts writing strategies here, but uh, ideally this should be probably 
Uh, so, okay, so he actually combined strategies from learning strategies with writing. Um, and so this is a related search term, but you get a lot more articles here. You get three and a half times as many articles uh, because this is going to be a more general selection of literature. And if you keep doing this, uh, if you just look for ESL writing, uh, you're going to get hundreds of papers and you're not going to be able to read all of these, but you could at least maybe browse a few pages of the results if you're not finding stuff that you need to find. Um, if these more specific searches. Um, and then I, I think this is meant to illustrate that, you know, if you go too general, it's not going to be helpful. So if you just search ESL in the Applied Linguistics Database, you find 1,200 articles, that's not helpful. That's not going to help direct you to anything that's relevant to your research. And so we're always sort of striking a balance between trying to find the most specific things that we can that are related to our research topics, uh, but also recognizing that uh, we might need to go a little bit broader and get some background information on some of the components of what we're researching. Um, so even if nothing in this last search uh, seems terribly relevant, or if I only get like two readable papers out of this, I might be able to find general information about ESL and writing and strategies um, that could form the basis for asking about learning styles or learning strategies. I, I, I'm realizing now these slides are sort of mixing up strategies and styles. Um, it's not clear to me whether those actually mean the same thing in uh, education research, but uh, you know, what, whatever the actual topics here, the point remains that if you back off to some extent from your specific research area, you're going to find something relevant in a more general area. Um, but if you go too general, you get uh, this barrage of, of information uh, that is not going to be able to be sorted through or processed in any way. So we're sort of striking a balance here all the time. Um, and it's worth uh, going through some examples of this um, just because this comes up, you know, several of you, I might have already done this in the, in the comments I sent you on your last homework. Um, it's always useful to try to kind of factorize your research topic and figure out what are the things that I'm going to need to go over uh, when I'm summarizing my topic, when I'm setting the background in the paper, when I'm trying to introduce readers to my general area of research, what am I going to need to outline here? Right? So um, here's a specific uh, topic, and this was what I wrote my second homework assignment on that I did the demo for. Um, and the question is, well, let's say I can't find any prior research on this specific topic. Um, what are the related topics that I might look for? Right? So here's the full complex topic. Uh, the effect of L1 properties on second language acquisition of Russian case. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is also referred to as transfer, I happen to know, because I've been reading some literature on this. Um, and so what are the related topics that I might look for? Well, uh, my general strategy in this case is to try to think about this complex research area, uh, this very specific research area, as like an interaction between a number of simpler research areas, right? So what would that look like? Well, we might uh, characterize this as uh, the interaction of transfer effects, second language acquisition, Russian, and case, right? Those are like four simple research domains. And so other things that I could look for, well, let's try multiplying uh, less than all four of those and see what happens, right? What if we do uh, second language acquisition and case, or second language acquisition and Russian and case, right? Presumably, we might not be finding uh, papers about transfer in particular, but we're going to find something relevant about how foreign language learners acquire case in general, or specifically even acquire case in Russian. I might be able to find literature on that. Um, what about if I can't find anything on case, leaving that out and seeing if there's any literature on uh, transfer effects in general in Russian uh, second language acquisition, or more generally transfer effects in second language acquisition. I mean, I can tell you that if you actually do this search without Russian, um, it's going to be one of these way too broad type things. You're going to find entire books uh, on transfer effects in second language acquisition. Uh, it might be worth reading a kind of overview paper or a secondary review uh, paper, but um, you know, you're not going to be able to find specific papers that are relevant to your topic just by searching for transfer effects in second language acquisition. That's a giant research area. Um, or uh, maybe even if I can't find 
anything about transfer effects or anything about transfer effects in Russian, maybe I can find something in general about second language acquisition and case systems in general. That would certainly be relevant and useful background um, that would not only help me understand my own topic better, uh, but would also help readers when I'm writing the paper. Uh, they're going to need some background on the things that I'm studying, and you'd want to go over, well, what does acquiring case look like in a second language? Oh, and I should say here um, that within the applied linguistics world, there are some influential theories, like I think the crash and monitor theory, that makes a distinction between acquisition of a language, which is implicit, and learning of a language, which is explicit. Um, and, you know, that may well be right or may well be worth distinguishing, but uh, in general in this class, in basic linguistics, we do not make any such distinction. We refer to uh, acquisition and learning uh, interchangeably in general, because usually when we're talking about first languages, all learning is essentially uh, implicit, and so we just use acquisition and learning to mean exactly the same thing, and I understand that's different in second language. Uh, acquisition or in applied linguistics, but um, that's how I'm using learning and acquisition here completely interchangeably. Okay, so I'm referring to this as decomposing or factorizing uh, research topics. Um, and uh, the complex research domain is going to be roughly like the interaction of several simpler domains. So there's the general phenomenon of L1 transfer, right, and that's going to be a research domain. Um, and then there's going to be the question of, well, how does that L1 transfer thing interact uh, specifically with the Russian language or with Russian grammar? Um, and how do the L1 transfer and Russian grammar aspects interact specifically with linguistic case or grammatical case? Um, and in particular, how does this uh, specific interaction between transfer uh, and Russian grammar and case systems interact with second language acquisition. I mean, I can't imagine what other kinds of uh, transfer effects there could be that aren't second language acquisition, but it's still useful to have that in there because it's a, it's a, um, a separate domain in some sense, right? Um, so what are we going to look for for potentially related topics? Uh, well, if you break down your topic in this way, you can generate ideas of what to look for by then sort of remultiplying uh, each of these simple factors, right? So if I'm looking up L1 transfer in general, right, or Russian in general, or case in general, um, obviously I'm not going to get very specific or very relevant results, um, although you can try and see what happens. Uh, but then when I start interacting these in smaller combinations that are broader and less specific, I'm going to generate ideas for things I could look up. And it's, this is not, you know, an, an automated algorithm that automatically returns, um, you know, only relevant uh, research domains to you. Some of these are going to be nonsensical, but the point is it generates possibilities to look at and things to think about, right? So, well, maybe I want to look at transfer times case. Right? That would certainly be relevant, even if it's not about Russian, right? Or maybe I want to look about uh, look at any of the other uh, interactions that I just listed on the previous slide. Um, and you know, some of these are not going to be worth looking at, but some of them will be. And that's the point: is that it generates candidate sort of domains that you could look into if you're having trouble finding uh, or figuring out what constitutes relevant background here. Um, so just as an exercise, it's worth uh, sort of trying this with a couple of research domains here. Um, and some of these are meant to be super technical where you're not even necessarily going to understand what the heck I'm talking about. Um, but the point is that even without having a deep knowledge of all of the background for these complex research topics, you can figure out what kind of background you'd need to look at in order to figure out what these are about, right? Um, and so this is not only a useful process for um, thinking about what to include in your literature review and for doing the literature review. This is also useful for figuring out new topics and figuring out what papers are about or what different kinds of research areas are about. So here's a super technical one from Syntax. Um, is topic-driven scrambling in Russian a type of A-bar movement? And I've included all sorts of technical syntactic vocabulary in here just to make the point that uh, for those of you who haven't taken the syntax class here, you're not even going to necessarily know what any of these things mean, except maybe Russian, right? Um, but the point is you can still figure out what you need to look up 
in order to see what this means. And so take a minute and think about what are some other searches you might do to try to figure out what's going on in this statement A. Well, so uh, topic-driven scrambling um, is a type of syntactic property um, or it's a description of certain kinds of languages where word order is flexible. Um, and in general, there's a specific kind of flexibility that's referred to as scrambling. There's lots of languages with flexible word orders, um, and scrambling refers to a particular kind of flexibility in word orders. Topic-driven is about um, semantics and information structure, um, and, and so what this is asking about is a kind of variability in word order that seems to be driven by um, what's the central topic of the sentence, uh, and of course Russian is Russian. Um, and then A-bar movement um, is a particular uh, other kind of syntactic phenomenon that involves a kind of mismatch uh, between the normal properties of sentences uh, and what kinds of things appear in which positions when you transform those sentences into questions or relative clauses or uh, topicalizations or things like that. Um, but more generally, it's not important for you to have a technical understanding of what any of these things mean in order to figure out what you'd need to look up, right? You need to look up uh, what is scrambling? What is topic-driven scrambling? You potentially would need to look up what's Russian if you've never heard of it. Um, Russian's probably a bad example because everybody in this classroom probably knows what Russian is, but I can easily think of a language that I could put in there uh, that maybe you've never heard of and you would need to figure out, well, what is that language and what family is it from or something like that. And then what is uh, movement and syntactic movement and what specifically is a bar movement? And these are all uh, pretty tough technical uh, notions that are going to be really hard to figure out, but if you wanted to understand this research topic, you'd have to understand all of the parts of it. Um, and then if you were actually writing a paper on this, well, you'd want to do some research on uh, topic-driven scrambling in Russian, uh, topic-driven scrambling as a bar movement. You'd maybe want to do some research on what a bar movement is and what are the criteria for distinguishing it from other kinds of syntactic movement. Uh, you might want to look up a bar movement in Russian. Uh, you might want to look up uh, all sorts of combinations of these simple parts where the simple parts are going to be basically topic driven, scrambling, Russian, uh, syntactic movement, and a bar syntactic movement. Right? Those are the sort of the simple domains here. Um, here's a second one. This one's more from a psycholinguistics or speech language pathology perspective. Uh, are deficits in statistical learning associated with specific language impairment related to low-level auditory processing? This is a real research question that, that's come up in uh, my collaboration with uh, Michelle Moore in the Communication Sciences Department here at WVU. Um, and uh, again, you know, some of these are more understandable than others. Right? So um, what is statistical learning? Well, it's a particular kind of ability that humans have to uh, acquire generalizations from the probabilistic properties of inputs that they're exposed to. Um, deficits are just, uh, you know, cases where people uh, have trouble with this statistical learning process. Um, and they appear to be associated with a specific disorder that's referred to as specific language impairment, or at least used to be referred to as specific language impairment. They keep changing the name. Um, and is that related to low-level auditory processing, where you could uh, break that into, you know, several different constructs, but really low-level auditory processing is going to be a single topic for the purposes of this uh, exercise. So how might you break this down? Well, you'd want to look up statistical learning. Uh, you want to have some background on that. Deficits in statistical learning. What do we know about uh, when and how and who and whether people have deficits in statistical learning? Uh, you definitely want to look up SLI, specific language impairment. Um, you'd want to look up the interaction of statistical learning and SLI. There's a literature on that. Um, is SLI related to statistical learning? Is it part of, uh, is it due to statistical learning deficits? You'd want to look up, um, you know, low-level auditory processing. You're going to get ridiculous amounts of literature there. Um, but then you'd want to look up well, is there research on SLI and low-level auditory processing? And yes, there is. 
Um, is there literature on the relationship between statistical learning and low-level auditory processing? There is, although I'll tell you it's not going to end up being super relevant to this. But the point is that if you're going to write a paper about this, and we just have, uh, actually, in real life, we're going to have to include background sections on each of these things. So in our paper, in our introduction, there's a section on statistical learning. There's a section on uh, how statistical learning is associated with specific language impairment, a section on how low-level auditory processing is associated with specific language impairment, and then we go through a discussion of why we might expect uh, this deficit in statistical learning to be uh, mediated or moderated by low-level auditory processing. So again, uh, even if uh, you find plenty of literature about your specific topic, you're still going to need to go through some of these simpler topics uh, in order to have sufficient background in your paper. Um, here's one that's more like a topic that a student would probably choose in this class. I wanted to start with some super complex ones to show you that you don't need to actually know all of the specific content in order to figure out what to look up or what needs to be reviewed. Um, here's a, a last one. Does the use of video games in the foreign language classroom aid in vocabulary learning? Well, uh, you might not be able to find any specific literature on this specific question, but again, factorize it. What's it going to look like? So this is basically the interaction of uh, video games, foreign language classroom, and vocabulary learning. Right? So what might you look for if you can't find any literature on the specific question? Well, what about video games and vocabulary learning? It's hard to see how that would happen outside the foreign language classroom, but maybe in a language arts kind of a class in a student's native language. Could be worth looking up. Uh, video games in the foreign language classroom. That's a good thing to look at. Uh, maybe just video games in the classroom, right? Outside of foreign language learning, if you can't find any uh, literature on this within the applied linguistics uh, domain, maybe look at some other domain. Have people used video games to teach other things in the classroom? Uh, vocabulary learning in the foreign language classroom. What do we know about that? How does it work? What's an effective way of teaching uh, vocabulary based on what we've seen in the previous literature? Um, Use of video games in vocabulary learning. Uh, that could be a possible thing to look at. Uh, the point is, you know, these all sort of work the same way, and they're going to generate a bunch of broader topics that have less content in them. Um, and some of those are going to be nonsense or are not going to be worth looking into or just going to be uh, way too broad, but some of them are going to be potentially valuable domains that you'll want to review when you do your literature review. Okay, um, I'm going to come back with a video about um, what I think literature reviews ought to be like.